There is a famous Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. And the reason that it's a curse is that any period of history which future historians are interested in is not a good time to be alive in. Wars, famine and pestilence, economic or political turmoil. These are the events which historians use to mark eras, but they are not pleasant times to live through. But it's the opposite in storytelling and by extension D&D. In literature, a world of peace and prosperity in which all the nations live in harmony, uh, in which music, literature and art flourish, no one goes hungry, is boring. When we read, we want conflict, especially between characters, whether it's with each other, with the world around them, or with themselves. So I'm going to give you an old GM's blessing. May your homebrewed world be interesting. Hello again, I'm K.R. King. And this is my YouTube channel dedicated to helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. I'm going to show you in this video how to make your world interesting for your players using this sort of events that in real life might not be so fun to live through. So I'm going to show different you know, calamities, catastrophes, uh, political turmoil, etc. Uh, and the idea here is to use these historical examples to create some verisimilitude, some realism to your world, but balancing the suspension of disbelief. We are in a fantasy world uh, with deities and monsters and magic, and we're going to incorporate those into how these transformative historical events occur. So one of the most obvious sort of catastrophes in a historical sense are natural disasters. Now, sometimes we think of these as short-term events that only affect a limited geographic area, you know, an earthquake or tsunami, uh, a flood or a forest fire, volcanic activity, we think, well, it only occurs over a short period of time in a small area. But in fact, there are natural disasters that can affect an area for a long period of time. And these kind of things will affect how people think about the world and how they behave. So for example, climate change. There are examples of climate change in the past. There was a famous little ice age that started about 1300 AD in Europe. And there's all sorts of theories of why it started volcanic activity, sunspots, etc. The point is it had a huge effect on societies of that time. The growing seasons were altered. There were famines. Uh, the feudal system sort of collapsed and serfs became much more valuable and they sort of exerting some control over their lives. Another sort of natural disaster that can affect things over a long period of time is a plague. Right now we're seeing the effects of COVID-19. Well, imagine something like the Black Death, which had a mortality rate of like 70%. And this occurred in combination with the Little Ice Age, which basically threw society into total turmoil. It changed our attitudes about death and mortality forever, and some say helped usher in the Renaissance. And the great thing about a fantasy setting is that you can give natural disasters more agency. Now in D&D, you have super powerful creatures that can affect the course of nature itself. And you have the immense power of magic, which underlies everything. So this suspension of disbelief in a fantasy setting allows you as a GM to provide an explanation and solution for these sort of catastrophes. It's the agency of some entity. It's something personal. Climate change is because of a titanic struggle between elemental creatures, or perhaps some sorcerer unleashed wild magic in her quest for infinite power. You can use the Sodom and Gomorrah trope, a land cursed by some god for their wickedness, causing them to be either thrust into a burning desert or some sort of arctic wasteland. And these effects will continue until someone, the players, will come along and atone for this wickedness, will right the wrong. And the great thing about this too is you can have generations of people in a land living under this curse or these conditions, and they can create a society based on dealing with this. So you might have armies of flagellants roaming across the countryside, you know, beating themselves in penance, or weird sects that claim we have the answer to the curse. Now you might think the plague trope is a bit overused, even in a fantasy setting. I mean, how many zombie movies can we see? But here again, I think that you need to be just a little creative and think about how the inherent power of fantasy to reconfigure, you know, how this plague came to be, its effect on people, its effect on the society that is suffering from. Now it has to be some kind of pandemic that's uh, immune to magical cures. You know, if you have some kind of a pathogen or effect that even a 20th level cleric can't cure, 
This is going to cause tremendous turmoil and anxiety in a society. And here again, this plague might be a curse from some deity or some high-level creature, but it may, might be from some unknown source. Unknown magic directed by some creature that's never been seen or leaking through some nexus point of the planes. So there's two things you want to consider when you're creating these sort of long period conflicts. The severity of the crisis and where it is in time when the players confront it. So if you have a plague that is basically like the walking dead, where almost everyone becomes a mindless, bloodthirsty zombie, you're going to have the complete breakdown of society. You're going to have a world in which this is just the only way to survive. And you might have players that are a little irritated if they're just thrust into this sort of dog-eat-dog -dog world. You know, I just want to roll up a character and run, get some levels, fight some things, have some fun. And now I'm in this post-apocalyptic hellscape. So you got to think about how severe is this and is it localized? Is it just one area? And the second thing is the time period by which the player is confronted. Is it at the beginning of the crisis? Is it in the middle? Or is it near the end or the after effects of this crisis? So if the players confront the beginning of a plague that's caused by some sort of weird magic emanating from some nexus point, they have an opportunity to stop it in its tracks before it infects, you know, in theory, the entire continent that they're on. Now, if they come across the plague at its height, they will see society at its breaking point. There may be mass chaos everywhere, uh, people hiding in their castles, you know, the countryside abandoned. It might be affecting the various monsters and creatures, a total hellscape. But maybe then you want to limit it to an area. And if the plague is at its end or just over, they find a desolate landscape where nothing lives. And don't forget about a quarantine effect in which an area that's beset by a plague is walled off, either physically or by magic. And here the players may have to go into this, you know, forbidden zone on some quest to get some item uh, to cure this. Uh, for future generations or other areas. Nothing better than the old expedition into the Forbidden Zone. Now, another potential for a historical event that causes great conflict in a society is a technological advancement. And this event outstrips a society's ability to handle its consequences. So if you think about the discoveries of the Renaissance, the coming into conflict with the teachings of the Catholic Church, and just ask Galileo how that worked out. The Industrial Revolution caused all sorts of social and political turmoil in the 18th and 19th centuries. When you have technological advancement in military weaponry, in which the tactics of society don't keep up, you can have a disaster. Think of the Napoleonic tactics used in the Civil War, uh, but the weaponry and artillery was much deadlier. Same thing in World War I. Machine guns, uh, high explosive shells caused the armies to come to a standstill. They sat in trenches for four years, unable to figure out what to do. So in a fantasy setting, you have a whole host of opportunities to introduce new technologies. And by that, I don't just mean like steampunk items, but you know, new magical systems, whatever. Why? Because unlike the real world, where it's an evolution of ideas among humans, you have celestials and demons, you know, users of great magic, things from other planes, and of course, the fabric of magic itself. And again, you have the time factor here. When do the players come across this new technology, this new power? If it's at the very beginning, maybe their quest is to uh, control this or uh, to give the keys to it to some powerful creature before it gets into the hands of everyone, uh, to seal off this area, uh, or uh, possibly to wield it. But again, this you got to make sure that it isn't too disruptive. If they come into the middle of this thing, uh, they have to, along with the rest of society, figure out how to adapt to this new power. And of course, at the end, uh, there are the ruins of civilizations who went too far in their explorations or their desire for absolute power. So next you have conflict on a grand scale between peoples, you know, wars between city-states, uh, fights over royal succession, a civil war that breaks up an existing state or a confederation of city-states, or an invasion from some outside source. And here again, timing is everything. If it's players come into contact with this at the beginning, maybe they can mediate a peace. Uh, maybe they can figure out who's fomenting this uh, rebellion or this civil war and stop them. Uh, if the players find themselves stuck in the middle of some endless civil war that's been going on and ravaging society, they might be the ones to try to figure out how to get the two parties or however many that come to a peace agreement? Or is it at the end in which the players come across a society ravaged by a war, 
you know, sort of like Europe after the Thirty Years' War, just totally devastated, people starving. They need to find a new way, a new method to come together. And again, this sort of world withheld in a certain geographic area can be fascinating for the players to work their way through. And of course, let's not forget an invasion, whether it's from a neighboring country or from some unknown force that's never been seen. You know, William the Conqueror taking England in 1066 was a huge event in the history of Britain and the world. Think about the Native American people sitting on shore watching Columbus's fleet come in. And again, in terms of timing, it can start for the players just like that. The emissaries of some unknown force, the players meet them, and then soon enough their evil intent becomes obvious, and we realize that there are hordes of other people just waiting to come ashore. And these can come from some other land across the sea, or the gateway to some unknown plane of existence. And even if the players don't see it initially, they could see it as this new invading force is gaining a foothold. It doesn't have to be so bad either. It might be a force that's good. The players see this, but the forces of the world, the evil forces of the existing structure want to wipe this out. They don't want this, you know, uh, new information uh, to, to become widely accepted and the players have to help them. And you can combine these world historical events uh, the people that came to the New World also brought diseases with them. Uh, they also brought technology that helped and hurt people. Uh, they brought intoxicants and all sorts of things. The native people sent back tobacco to the old world as well. So there's this interchange that can alter societies. And there's a final world event, and this is, can be sometimes tricky, where the players themselves are the center of some epochal, history-changing set of circumstances. And as I said, this can be the trickiest to pull off because, one, the characters are real people. They're not necessarily some world-changing figure, but two, it might not be in their interest in terms of playing the game. When you say to them, you have the mark of the chosen one, and everyone is all in a turmoil, and that person's like, me? I just wanted to roll up a barbarian and get into some battles and have some fun. Now, that doesn't mean that your players, in concert with, you know, powerful deities or NPCs or whatever, become involved in some event that's going to, you know, save the material plane or alter the course of history. That can be really fun. But you just want to balance it in terms of it doesn't just consume them from the beginning of the campaign. You don't have to have a post-apocalyptic hell world, and you don't have to have some unbelievably urgent thing that's centered right on the players, and they have to do this right now. You know, let them breathe in the world, let them explore, and let them find out about this. If they launch something, if something they do uh, creates some, you know, history-changing event, then you can limit it in terms of its scale of what it does and the area that it affects. You just want to make sure that your players are on board with either being a part of this or being the central part of it. So there you have some ideas of making the time period of your world interesting times. Interesting for you to run and your players to be in. If you've liked what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel and please give me some comments. I'd love to hear about events you've used to amp up your world or make your players more exciting or campaigns you've run in where you've, you've had these kind of events, whether they worked or didn't work. And of course, in the meantime, Keep playing D&D &D and tell somebody else about it.